Hello, everybody. Welcome to this special bonus episode of the Flicker Effect podcast. Uh, we will be talking about spoilers for Spider-Man Homecoming. Uh, we just recorded our non-spoiler review in episode 222. But we're sticking around. We're going to talk about spoilers for this film. So uh, this is our one and only warning. If you haven't seen Spider-Man Homecoming yet, go see it and come back. And then uh, listen to this afterwards. You don't want to hear this yet. Go enjoy the movie first. Or hopefully enjoy the movie. We'll see. Um, so, yeah, guys. Guys, let's jump right into it. <laughs> <laughs> so guys, just, I can't talk. Let's <laughs> Let's just talk about uh, that Spider-Man movie. So, I mean, I'll recap for myself real quick. Uh, when we just talked about it on our regular show, uh, I basically gushed about the movie. I, I love the movie quite a bit, actually. I didn't really have any issues with it. <laughs> I like the movie a lot. Um, I also admitted that I'm going into it with not a lot of background about Spider-Man. never really read the comics. So, I definitely have questions for you guys. And I'll just maybe start off with one of those. And we'll just kind of go from there, wherever we go. And my question is, I'm curious to know what everybody thought about the suit. I am curious. Um, the 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 suit in this is definitely obviously we know it's made by Tony Stark, and uh, it's uh, it's definitely got an Iron Man kind of feel to it. It turns out the we find out like once his friend kind of hacks the suit oh. that the suit uh, has got its own basically Jarvis inside. It's not Jarvis. It's it's somebody else. And um, yes. <laughs> No, no, please keep going. I'm super excited because I can't wait to talk about this. Can't wait to talk about who voiced it. Yeah. (laughs) Um, (laughs) So yeah, it's. I mean, it's. uh, It's quite a high tech. uh, Quite a high tech suit. And I mean, again, I. I didn't read a lot of Spider Man or any. And uh, but I'm pretty sure I don't know how often in Spider Man comics he had a suit quite like that. So I was curious if. Uh, what your guys' reactions were to it. Like, were you like, oh, come on, this isn't Spider-Man, what the fuck is this? Or did you not care? I mean, we all seem pretty happy with the movie for the most part. So uh, I don't think it bothered anybody too much, but maybe it did. I don't know. Bobby, like, you, know, you seem to be more the Spider-Man expert. Uh, what'd you think of it? When Civil War was coming out, and I remember that um, either I had read about it or... It was during the course of the movie, but I'm pretty sure I had read about it somewhere that they were saying that Tony Stark would be the person who gives Spider-Man his suit. And I was at that time pretty upset because the whole aspect of his character, well, I shouldn't say the whole, but one aspect of his character is that he he creates his own suit. He creates his own web slingers. He creates everything about it because He's the only person who knows his secret identity. It's not like Tony Stark was around to know his identity and help him out. So all these things were done of his own mind. And I felt like that had kind of been robbed from the character a little bit when when I had read that um, Tony Stark was going to invent the suit. But then, obviously, it's been enough time from me learning about that and seeing Civil War and then knowing that this was coming to get on board with that idea and just sort of embrace it and along those lines it's it's pretty much like i've made peace with the fact that that's not what we're getting in this version in this iteration because in the comics yeah there's different times within the 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 character's run where he has invented a lot of the stuff that you see in the in the um in the actual movie where there's sort of web grenades or like uh, taser webs and stuff like that. He's done those types of things at different periods of time. And I'd say the most recent run had really sort of um, put the character into an aspect of his life where we already knew he was a genius from ever, you know, in terms of the character being around. But now he was actually utilizing his genius and putting it to work. And in in a sense, he was almost like a Tony Stark-esque character because he had his own uh, corporation called Parker Industries and he's like running things like as if he's an Iron Man in a sense but yet he doesn't take a um, a salary uh, other than what a, a, me- a regular level um, 
general manager would take. And so he uses his money and he donates it to all kinds of different things and stuff. So it's still the core of his beliefs, but yet just utilizing him in a way that showing off his genius and him developing a lot of different tech, which he can do. And so it was for me, um, like I said, initially jarring, but I got used to the idea and I liked the aspect of getting to see these things rather than not see them and being able to just all incorporate it all into one suit instead of say, oh, in the next movie he gets taser webs and in the movie after that he gets uh, grenade webs and they just do it all at once. I was like, that's probably the better way to go with it because we can see it all now. And I'm sure there's other aspects in other webbing. I mean, but what there was like 500 and some different combinations of webbing that he could do. So there's tons more that they could uh, mess around with and play around with in terms of being able to show more that he can do. And I was fine with it at this point. But um, yeah, initially it it did bug me, but I got over it. Yeah, Shane, any thoughts? Um, no, I mean, Bobby kind of covered it all. Like we, I felt kind of similar the same way when watching it. It's just kind of like an acceptance to the changing of the tide, I guess you could say. And I just kind of rolled with it and just accepted it for what it was in the movie that I was watching and just really enjoyed it. Cool. Michelle? Yeah, no, I like the suit. I think it's just because knowing that Tony... Tony's the one that gave it to it. The fact that the technology's there, it just kind of is just, it just makes sense. Like, do you know what I mean? Like, no, he didn't have a talking suit to him when he was, you know, in the comics when he was a kid, you know, young. When it was all started, this isn't how it went. But Tony giving him the suit and having the suit have this technology and go this way and already just be this advanced, it makes sense. Like, it just, it just makes sense. Like, if Tony's going to give you something, you know, it's going to be pretty pimp. Like, it just is. It's it's Tony Stark. Like that's what's gonna happen. You have to acknowledge that and you just go with it. Yeah, I know I agree with you exactly, Michelle. It's like, you know, you just kinda roll with it and just roll with the punches. It's like, yeah, that totally fits with what's going on right now. So yeah, that's gonna right. be pretty badass and I'm gonna accept it. And it's I'm just working with it. Like, that's awesome. So I gotta say though, I'm super excited about the voice that's in the suit. Yes. It's like mm-hmm. the weird, like little girly part of me was like I love it so much. It makes me so happy. It's a nice Easter egg. It is. It's lovely. Okay, so here it is. So <laughs> the voice inside of Spider-Man's suit is, well, Spider-Man, so Peter names her Karen, right? So Karen is voiced by Jennifer Connelly. Yay! Now, if everybody knows, Jennifer Connelly is married to a lovely British actor named Paul Bettany. And who is Paul Bettany? I'm sure everybody should know at this point. But Paul Bettany plays the voice of Jarvis and then becomes Vision. Hey! It's all in the family now! I'm so happy! It's so adorable! I ship it so much. It makes me so happy. I ship it. Wow. Wow. (laughs) When I heard that, I was I was pretty stoked too. I mean, it is pretty cool, like to do that. If you're going to give a voice to a Spider-Man suit and to come up with the idea of Jennifer Connelly, not to mention she's still in the Marvel extended family. If you think about the first Incredible Hulk movie, because she was in that. Yeah. If you really want to get it, yeah. If you really want to get into that, but. yeah, no, and I have to say, like, I love her voice. Like, it sounds spectacular. Like, I was like, oh my god, I love it so much. It's, just, it's so, it's so, uh-huh. it's calming and reassuring and nurturing, and yet very informative. I loved it. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> well, you liked that part of the movie. I did. I was honestly even <laughs> like, I was like, oh my god, oh my god, oh my god, it's gonna be showing, it's gonna be happening soon. Yeah. I mean, I also I didn't know. With- so you knew it was going to have a voice before you saw the movie. I did because I'd heard a rumor that she was um, doing the voice for right. it, and I was like, oh my God. "Yeah, no, I didn't. Oh I didn't know till afterwards." Oh my God. So, oh my God. Like, the whole him had the voice, the suit having a voice was, "Oh, okay." I mean, and, well, I mean, and again, I went trailer. to it. I does it? Yeah, I like, think there was another trailer where it happened. I because I, I had the same sort of thought. Yeah, because I, I skipped that trailer because I, I didn't see it. <laughs> I knew she was, uh, no, I, sorry. I knew that their suit had a voice, but I couldn't tell you why I knew it. it. Either I read it somewhere or I remember hearing a trailer description and hearing that the in the trailer that the suit 
talks or something, but yeah. I knew it somehow. But in I the, didn't know about the um, Jennifer Connelly part until this past uh, week, I guess. Yeah, in the one trailer, the voice comes on as he's looking out of his eyes, and he's looking at his hands or something, and she says the web combination count that he has, and that happens in the trailer. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I just don't remember if it if it's all if it was in the trailer I saw. I guess I just was like, eh, right. didn't think about it again. Or but something. anyways, it's it's one of those fun little Easter eggs that I just it just made, it just makes my day. It's little things for me. That's cool. <laughs> um, Sorry, I'm gonna get... No. So, what are some things you didn't like, Michelle? I'm curious. Oh God. <laughs> I only go right into it because uh, you definitely seem like there was a lot you had to say, but in our other review. And, the, but. and, and I'm going to say this, and honestly, it's I, I feel like I'm going to point these things out, and I'm going to sound uber nitpicky. Oh, stop it. Just... But the thing is, is with these things, there's an overlying theme to it, and that's that I feel like there are times that the film kind of goes out of the Spider-Man theming. And, and I'm saying this, and I... It makes me sound like a prude in a way, but like um, there's moments where I was like, this is really v- violent, like, and I feel like it's jarring out of what we're seeing a lot. So to put this into context, so Vulture, right? He's a, he's the bad guy, whatever. The character that is now the name is escaping me of what he actually is, the man's name that plays, that actually is Vulture played by Michael Keaton. He's not necessarily a bad guy, okay? He's that's just not what's happening here. So when this one scene happens and the guys come back from messing up the sales job and he grabs a gun, I feel like incinerating the guy while he does say in the next line, "Oh, I meant to grab the other gun." It felt really harsh to me like, "Wow, he just incinerated a dude." And he even says, like, that wasn't his intention. And I'm like, then why do it? Like, it just seems so, like, wow, for the mood of this film and the mood of the way this is going, this seems extremely harsh in a way to just incinerate a dude. Like, you couldn't have frozen him and thrown him into a freezer? Like, it just... To be clear, when you say, like, you couldn't have done this or you couldn't have done that... You're saying more like uh, as a creative decision by like the director yes. of the studio. You don't yes. mean that character. Not the character. Okay. Well, uh, th- but they're making the character do that. R- right. I want to make sure we're clear by yes. what you mean by that. And I was just like, wow, that was a huge leap because obviously the man, and again, I'm saying he's not necessarily a a bad man. He's just, he's let himself get, he's angered at the world and he's doing what he's doing to make money to ensure the security of his family and himself and his life. I get that. It just was like, wow, that's jarring, not just for this character, but just as this the way this feel of this film is going as a wholesome e kind of thing. And then um and and again, this makes me just sound like I'm like, you know, I don't know, like an eighty five year old woman. But like so Zendaya at the homecoming dance who's playing the character of Michelle, um, she jokingly flips Peter Parker the bird. I'm like, whoa. And I admit, there's cursing in Marvel films and things happen, but I was like, this is... Whoa, dude. Like, one, I don't know anybody balls enough to just flip the bird in the middle of their homecoming and just be like, yep, nobody's going to give two shits. But wow, I just felt like... This is not the way this theming is going. And I know you're trying to make her seem like a badass and they're just kind of having this weird joke moment between each other. But it just was like, it just didn't fit to me. Like it really like jarred me. I was like, what the hell? Like really? Was that even remotely necessary for this scene? And I don't think it is at all. And this is coming from a person that lovingly flips the bird at people like I do it out of anger and out of love and I just felt like it was just out of character for that character and it was out of character for the theme and feel of the way the movie and the scene was going the scene was already pretty intense with his conversation with um what's Tume Tume Tome I can't think of what it is now 
Where's the tomato? Tombs. Tombs. Oh, you're Thank about you. One. So he just has this conversation with Tombs, and I'm just like, this is extremely jarring from the feel that we have going on from that scene. And it's just kind of like little things like that kind of kept popping up. And I was just like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Yes, while things get really dark sometimes and things get really hard for Peter, these just don't fit in my opinion of what's happening and some of the themes of what is going on. And even then, like, I don't know. It's like, I feel like Spider-Man has... um, he has villains that, you know, I'm going to kill him, blah, 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 blah. But at one point, Vulture's actively really trying to kill him. And I'm like, dude, usually that's not the, the MO all the time. Like, they're not, especially with Vulture. And even because, in obviously, that's what I'm saying. Like, his character is clearly, a he's a, a decent man. Especially from the end credit scene, that, or the mid credit scene that we get. You know, he's like, nope, don't know who it is. Totally saves his butt, right? Like, this isn't necessarily an evil person. And so for him to, at one point, literally be actively trying to kill Peter was like, well, Jesus. Like, we keep swinging back and forth on this. And I'm just, it just, that for me bothered me. And that's my biggest pet peeve. Outside of these things, I thought the film was very good. I enjoyed it a lot. And it was really yeah, it was good. It was great. It was fun. <laughs> For the most part, I had a lot of fun with it. I love the playfulness that Peter's Peter is, and yeah, no, I'm. It, it's it's all good for the most part, really. So those are my things, and I'm sure Bobby's going to be like, "Well, Stop. <laughs> here it comes." So I'm waiting for the hammer to drop. Uh, <laughs> but that's what that's that's just my feelings. I'm sorry. Those are just my feelings on it. Uh, I mean, all I could say is, I guess I just did not have the, in those reactions to any of those moments, like, like the flipping of the bird, I felt like it fit just fine. I, I felt like her character would have done something like that, you know, is a, is the weird way that she's kind of even masking her true emotions about situations. Right. I, I, I don't, I, yeah, I just, I know all I can speak is from my experience watching the movie. I was like, okay. And kind of broke some of the tension of what we had just seen. You know, I, I thought it worked just good. And, uh, I mean, and I don't know, my take on Vulture, and again, uh, you know, it sounds like you're referencing a little bit to, like, what some of the villains were like, you know, in kind of in the comics and such. But all I can say is in the context of this movie, you know, I, I get what you're saying. That's the nice thing about this villain is that uh, he's more relatable he he's not just a straight up oh i'm just an evil guy he's he's more complex than that he's he's just a regular dude that's trying to take care of his family and you know over the what was it an eight year period is that what we were told at the beginning of the movie um you know he is now uh, doing what he's doing to you know make money and i guess to protect his family and take care of them but it does seem like over this eight year period which we didn't witness from his point of view he definitely seems now when we see him eight years in the future he, he's he's become more and more jaded and not so good of a guy i did not look at him for most of this movie which is then eight years later from when you know this event we see at the beginning of the movie that kind of starts all this he he doesn't strike me as a good guy much i wouldn't say much at all i mean yeah he's a he's a family he's still a family man he's still a dad but I don't know, like him saying things he wants to kill Spider-Man and it didn't strike me as that out of character. It, he seems like over this eight year period, he has grown this, this darkness more in within him is that's the impression I got. Go ahead. I just don't think no, he's innately evil your, your is yeah. what I mean. Um, I mean, that's all I was really going to say on that though. Like, uh, that's just, I don't know. I, like, and then the gun thing, you know, I mean, like you said, he, he says right off the bat, he didn't, he thought that tech had told him that this was that gun and it wasn't, and he thought he was going to use another gun. And, uh, but even so he doesn't have much of a, Oh shit, I just did that reaction. Right. Right. And, but at the same time, I, I don't know. It, it didn't strike me as something that would be that out of character for him to get that upset that this guy was kind of jeopardizing everything. Right. for him and, and, and 
So him, it feels like, oh, I didn't mean to kill him, but I guess if I did, like, I guess I did. And I, that, I don't know. It worked for me. And I'm not saying that he should feel remorse for it. I'm just simply saying like, I just feel like as a whole, there's, there's, it's just, it feels very drastic from the feeling that you're getting of everything else that's happening. People, I don't know. It just seemed like it was, whoa, this is overly violent all of a sudden really fast from where we've been this whole picture and the overall feeling that the picture had had. That's all I'm saying. Uh, you were going to say something, Bobby? Yeah, so I guess I can disagree and agree with what Michelle has said. And uh, as far as specifically speaking with the vulture and Michael Keaton and him playing Tombs, Adrian Tombs, I would... I would definitely say, uh, as you mentioned, David, that he he's definitely not a good guy. Um, he cares for his family, but that's that is what it is. I mean, I would definitely not say Tony Soprano is a good guy, even though he cares for his family. Same way, I would not say that about the Kingpin, even though he cares for Vanessa and he like you know is a caring person. But that's what makes them good villains, is because they show shades and signs of humanity. And so I think that's what makes a good villain as opposed to someone that's just completely evil because there's nothing there you can connect to. And he always seems to go to his breaking point when something threatens the livelihood of his family. But I would say that reason number one why he's not a good guy is that he invented, well, I shouldn't say he invented, the, the tinkerer invented tech that could make wings for a person to fly. I'd say maybe you might want to, mm, I don't know, sell that to the government or someone and make millions of dollars and you wouldn't have to worry about making tech for uh, common criminals to be able to rob ATMs. So, right. I mean, he's, he's so ta- not- He's so tainted by the system that he doesn't even want it, it, like earn money off of them. He'd rather earn it off of criminals. Yeah, it's like right. he's just, I mean, if he was really in it for any kind of other thing he has this guy here who's inventing all this crazy tech that could be used in in a multitude of different ways that then what it was being used for and him not caring that it was being used in that way and maybe possibly hurting someone else's family or something else shows that he really kind of only worried about his own interest and his family so that that as where I kind of say, you know, I can see where he goes to that level and, and just, yeah, he kills the guy and he's like, well, you know, uh, I guess I didn't mean to do that, but he was in my way because he's starting to talk about exposing me and I can't have that. And I don't really know, honestly, what he was going to do when he thought it was the anti-gravity gun. <laughs> like, what was that going to do in terms of keeping right. him quiet? Right. But, um, I mean, I only saw one way out of that situation, which was he, as soon as he mentioned that, he had to go. And um, the stuff with Zendaya and um, the dance, I did get the same sort of feeling in the sense that I laughed, but I thought it was a little off-putting that she flipped the bird. And just a lot of the language in general, because there was a lot of kids in, in my audience and sort yeah. of like the, the the some of the language in terms of um, maybe not every kid hears this all the time or they're young kids that it seemed sort of like, wow, ouch, you know. Mm-hmm. And so I was uh, it, that did throw me uh, the, the language and that uh, was only not necessarily for myself. But being hyper aware of who else was in the audience right. and watching the movie. And there was a part where even one of the characters uh, was in it was Ned and he's in school and um, he's getting caught by the, one of the teachers in the like computer lab. And he's like, I'm watching porn. And it's like right. everybody was laughing. Thank but you. then you like explain to a kid and like, well, why is everyone laughing about that? And you're like. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you later after after the movie, and you never tell them because right. they forget about and it. And I but mean, it's... I mean, like other Marvel movies can kind of get away with it, and because they're geared a little bit more. But Spider Man's Spider Man's usually family friendly. He's so a little more family friendly. More... He is. I mean, like, 
and I'm not saying like I'm going, oh, well, it's not Deadpool. Like when you go see Deadpool, you're expecting this. Like I get that. But even like, you know, you watch the Avengers, there's there's some language and there's I mean, there's probably been a finger if I can really go back to thinking about things. But I almost kind of expect that. These are full adults. And I'm not saying that high schoolers and middle schoolers don't use this language and don't flip the bird. Lord knows I did. But it just seems so out of the theme of what is happening to me, in my opinion, for this film. That's that's all I'm saying. Yeah, and I, I can agree to a certain sense. that, Like, I, if it was just me, I'd be fine with it. But knowing that he appeals to such a, mm-hmm. a wide demographic, especially younger kids, it, 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 it did make me more aware of it, that it was there. But um, if I had to actually go to some negatives, and I don't have very many, but I do have just a few. I actually saw, I did see the movie twice. I saw it once in Dolby, and I saw it the second time in a regular theater. And because the quality of Dolby is that <laughs> of such clarity and the high resolution, um, it points out things in a way that I don't think everyone else maybe notices or, or get in a, in a different type of viewing. So when I was watching it in the Dolby, there's definitely times, obviously, when the character is CGI because a regular human can't do the things that Spider-Man is doing. And it... I could see that in in the film when I was watching in Dolby, and when I saw it in a regular theater, the it's the resolution isn't as sharp as it is in a Dolby, and so it it actually helped that sense. It helped cover up the uh, CGI because it wasn't as sharp. So it was interesting that I was able to see it in in a different light when I was um, seeing it in a non Dolby theater. It actually worked a little bit better with the CGI, but. Um, and that's sort of like a, a a problem with the the presentation more so than the actual movie itself, because the CGI is going to be there. It, you can't get around it for based on what the character it, it is and does. But um, one of the things that I actually did have an issue with, and this is uh, something innate to the character that they took away. Although I did read an article and there was an explanation there was that he doesn't have his spider sense. And that's like taking away one of his best abilities because it gives him that. that. What's that, Yasha? I didn't know that. Well, you can tell that he doesn't have it in a sense because too many people kept walking, like, you know. Sneak up on him. Seeing him, like, if his spider sense would have warned him when Ned was in the room Mm -hmm. that someone else is there and could reveal his identity or he, he wouldn't he wouldn't do it and so um there there's that aspect I and mean, i did read an article by kevin Faye and he said uh that basically he does still have it but his explanation without really sort of saying too much about it is that you'll see it later develop and maybe the the the, the idea they're going for is that his body is still changing, so mm. his powers aren't in full effect just yet. And so that's something that will kind of come later on. And he didn't have it in this movie, even though um, it's something that in the comics, he gets all his powers all at once. They don't just sort of like develop slowly over time. But um, yeah, that was like sort of the main thing that bothered me. That and just the fact that I think a lot of times in these uh, superhero movies, Especially the Spider-Man ones, I can count through all of them, where it seems like too many people always know the secret identity of the, right. the superhero. And that's something in the comics they truly safeguard for quite a while unless a story dictates someone finding out. But generally speaking, no one knows the identity. Whereas in this movie, you got Happy knowing it, Tony knows it, his best friend knows it. So... I will say the the best reveal of him of uh, finding out oh. uh, who he is was Aunt May at the very end of the movie cuz that was pretty hilarious. That and was spectacular. I, yeah, so I love the way was, they just cut and, it too. And and it's kind of cool in the sense too because of the fact that uh for years and years and years and years and years and years Aunt May never knew that Peter Parker was Spider-Man and it I'd say maybe within the last 15, 20 years, she knows that he's Spider-Man. 
And so it's giving you that aspect of it to where you can move forward past the he's sneaking around and Mm -hmm. has to do all these things without her knowing and moving right into the fact that, okay, we've had two iterations of Spider-Man where she didn't know. So let's play with it in a way that she does know, but she doesn't necessarily approve, but can kind of understand why he does what he does. So I I do like that aspect that they sort of uh, furthered that a little bit more than um, what they what they have in the past movies, but um, I guess the the other, uh, I guess that's pretty much it for my for my nitpicks. Because uh, like I said, they're nitpicks and they're things I can definitely uh, get past. But if there's going to be some negatives to talk about, those those would probably be mine. But um, one of the other things that I, I had wanted to mention that I had thought was done really really well in the movie was when they reveal that adrian tombs is actually the father of uh the 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 girl that peter likes i all of a sudden forgot her name in the movie like liz Um, isn't it liz yes thanks yeah so i thought that was really well done and both times when i saw it the audience just gasped like the very loud audible gasp when he opens the door and so they they pulled that off really really well because you I, I didn't really have that inclination of that was going to happen in that way but i thought it was very well done you know it's funny i feel like my spidey sense went off like as he gets out of aunt may's car and is walking up i'm like things have been really effing calm on a few fronts and all of a sudden i was like i just i had this weird feeling i was like something feels off and the moment i'm like something's not right the door opens and I was like, dude, I was like, mm. I knew, I was like, I knew something was going to happen. Like I felt it. Like I just felt like it was building towards this like thing for a second. And I didn't know what it was. But I was like, something feels very off all of a sudden. Like th- I don't know what it was, but it's just something just like clicked. And I'm like, oh, it feels weird. The setup is really weird all of a sudden. Mm. And yeah, that happened. I was like, oh my God, my spotty senses are working. So, oh, awesome. Uh, I guess while we're talking about nitpicks, Yasha, you have any nitpicky things you wanted to to bring up? Well, I mean, I wasn't entirely sure about the spider sense. Like, I was kind of wondering about that until Bobby, you just confirmed it. So that that I'm right there with you with that being kind of a nitpicking thing. Although, if Kevin Feige, Feige says that it's because Peter's still developing as a as a man and developing some of his powers, I mean, that's cool, and I can kind of understand that. So that's kind of one little nitpick. Um, the the small ones that I really did have was the changes of some of the characters, but at the same time I can kind of get behind it and appreciate what they're doing with these characters and making it making a change. Um, like Tony Ravoli's Ravolori's character, the Flash, mm. you know, Flash in the movie. I mean, Flash in the comic book, as far as I can remember, has always been this big burly. Um, jock that bullied P- Peter because he was a geek. He wasn't part of the geek, the geek. Forgive me, the geek squad of you know being part of the academic decathlon and and all that stuff. Now I understand why they made that change and you know kind of after reading some of the articles that I have, understanding why they did it, they've done it, and the direction that they were going with it to try and make it a little bit more relatable to today. So I mean that's fine. But that was kind of like something that I was nitpicking on. Also, the arrival of MJ. Now, I don't know if this is, you know, Michelle, the character at the end of the film, when she reveals that her friends call her MJ. That kind of, I I wasn't a huge fan of that, but at the same time, I can kind of get behind the idea that that's why they made that uh, a certain change for that. Because I'm so ingrained with the the MJ that I've, now, I don't know if this is the actual MJ or the MJ from the comic books that they're trying to make her into, and they just try to change. That's not. No, uh, I, I was going to address that at some point, but I guess this is a, a good time because Kevin Feige also jumped in and cleared that up as well. He, he, and I'll, I'll read his um, little quote that he has. Um, it says, in setting up, this will be a very different thing. She's not Mary Jane Watson. That's not who the character is. But giving her the initials that remind you of that dynamic certainly is intriguing about what could go forward. Clearly, she says she's not obsessed with him. She's just observant, but she's there and to have fun with that while at the same time having it be different characters that can provide a different dynamic is the point. So it's not Mary Jane Watson. 
Okay, see, I, I didn't know that, but I'm the layman when it comes to something to that, and I feel like I'm still pretty knowledgeable when it comes to that. So that's one of my, my little nitpicks on that, in that particular character. I just, I'm really hoping that they kind of get the character of MJ right this go around in this film because the person that, or the character that I'm used to reading about and seeing in comics and stuff has always been, is like, the popular girl, the every girl that everybody wants to try and be super popular, very successful, and just kind of finds an interest in Peter Parker. And, you know, they end up, you know, being together, obviously, uh, towards the long run. But, I mean, aside from that, I really don't have too many nitpicks about the characters or um, the direction that the film did, went. I really enjoyed all the, all the surprise villains that they had in the film, especially when they mentioned the Shocker, and then you see the Tinkerer, and... You know, it just feels like they're building a bigger scorpion. Right, right. And scorpion showing up. Yes. Um, thank you, Bobby. Um, I thought that was great that they showed these characters kind of showing up and like being a part of this world already, but not overdoing it in this world already. And, you know, making it so blatant, but just subtle, mm-hmm. like, hey, this is what we're going for. And this is what you can expect. Like with this, I can already see and feel like, you know, they're probably they're trying to build. They might be trying to build towards a Sinister Six type of thing. But I mean, it just it really flowed well. The fluidity of the film was really great. And I thought the changes, like I said before, even when it came to the costume, they all kind of made sense and it all worked really well. No, so. I- Oh. Sorry, I was just going to say that I agree with Yasha on on Flash. Like, it's bizarre for me to see Flash in the light that he's in. I've I've also also seen Flash as being the rich, preppy, jock, popular guy. And so while he's rich and he's kind of, I guess, the popular guy in this, he's definitely not a jock. And I feel like Flash was always kind of a jock. Like it just was. He was the the main football player, right? Like yeah, it. It was just weird to kind of see his to see it portrayed the way it was, like just this kind of almost really wussy kid that was just hiding behind daddy's money and trying to pretend like he's cool and popular. Like it was, it was just different. It was a completely different take on Flash than I think I'm used to as well. I'm with you on this a hundred percent, Yasha. Yeah, and like I said, it's like well, I can understand some of the the, the little right. changes with that. You know, maybe. I can get, I guess, accept it and just kind of move past it. Right. The character that we were used to seeing and reading about is like we just talked about is like this amazingly, you know, super good looking guy, had a lot of money. Crazy super athletic. Right. Yeah. Talked a lot of trash to Peter. Right. Always messed with him. You know, this one is like he's smart and he's part of this, you know, the debate team. Uh, and, and yeah, he's, the, he's the, the, he's the, the lower guy of the decathlon. Deca- he's lower like, end of the decathlon, but he's still f- smart enough to, to do it, you know? Like, yeah, yeah it's weird. It's, like, really? it's weird That's, because Flash always okay. dated like a tutor because he was always stupid. Like, he was always like the, like, when it came to actual educational or to actual uh, academics, Flash was never very good at that. Like, it's just, yeah. it's just different to see him portrayed in this light. That's all. Yeah. I mean, I, I, like I said, it's like I accept it and I'm good with it totally. and I'll move past it. But it's like subtle changes like that just kind of surprise me. And yeah. like you said, like even with the the MJ thing, Bobby, like you had to explain that to me. Right. Not everybody's going to know that. And I'm deep into this stuff like, you know, like you and like everybody else here and people that are listening. But I mean, the first my first thought when he, she said MJ, I was like, are you kidding? Like this outcast is supposed to be this super popular hot chick that he's supposed to fall in love with i will say if if that had worked out that way i i kind of get what they were trying to do and go for in terms of like i I was reading where zendaya said that for her role as michelle she didn't wear any makeup and so when you normally see zendaya she looks quite different than what she looked like in 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 spider-man so i imagine if that was the direction they were going then she would become sort of like the ugly duckling turning into the beautiful swan. And she would be more like how you see her uh, in her uh, everyday life. And she would be that person, eventually grow into that person, grow into herself and as she gets older. And, right. and all these movies are supposed to take place as a, a, a year within the, the life. And so 
I guess the next year they'd be uh, juniors. And so maybe in, in within that time, you know, during summer she blossoms and she comes back to school and she's super hot or whatever. But um, yeah, with her not being actual Mary Jane, then it, it's, it gives them room to do kind of whatever they really want with that character. And they yeah. did say she will have an expanded role in the in the sequel. That's fine because I thought her character was a lot of fun. Like the yeah. whole middle finger thing didn't really bother me as much as it sounded like it bothered Michelle. I thought it fit true to her character, and it just kind of, you know, I can see kids doing that or junior or high school kids doing that, you know, at a dance, like being, you know, just being funny, like being assholes to each other. Like one, <laughs> one of the funniest things I laughed at. I don't. I I heard people laughing, but I don't know if everybody sort of caught it. Was uh, when Captain America came on screen, and he and he's telling uh, the class about working out or whatever. And the gym gym class goes, "All right, uh, you know, I'm pretty sure this guy's a fugitive, but he's giving good life lessons. Right, (laughs) a war criminal or something." He said, "I I pretty sure this guy's a war criminal now, but uh, I still have to play these videos." I think he says something like that. He's like, "I I get paid to play these videos, so let's just do this." (laughs) Yeah. Um, well, we do need to wrap things up, but I do want to mention on the MJ thing. Um, I will say from like someone like my perspective, uh, I find that a weird decision to do that kind of nod to MJ, Mm -hmm. even though that's not really MJ because like for people like me who I have enough knowledge to know who MJ is, but not too much knowledge about like this whole universe, you know, maybe like that I, that a lot of people will find that confusing. You know, I mean, yeah. and it's the same people that will still like if, you know, maybe co-workers who watch movies but aren't obviously as into them as me. And I'll still maybe have a conversation where somebody would be like, oh, yeah, I remember how, like, what's his name at the end of Dark Knight Rises? He was Robin. I'm like, no, he wasn't Robin. <laughs> like, You know, yeah. it, it's like that. And I find that to be yeah. an odd choice because you're going to have a lot of people that are going to like, oh, yeah, she was in, she's MJ. I'm like, well, mm-hmm. no, she's not. I know yeah, that yeah, doesn't make any funny. sense. It, it was. You're, you're <laughs> right, right, David. No, it was totally a really weird that. nod to kind of have and kind of do. Yeah, so it's I just... I, like a little throw-in right there. It's like, why? Wh- like, why you know, right, why right. would you it do that to choice. so many people? Oh, it is. Because well, you can still uh, get do... the emotional... Like, you can still get the sense of what she's got going on emotionally for Peter right. Parker without that line uh, to add an extra connection about yeah. like what kind of relationship they will end up having. Right. So I, I just... I don't know. I found it unnecessary. But I, I also do wonder if, because Kevin Feige never outright said, oh, we'll be introducing Mary Jane at some later point in time. If they even will introduce her as a character, he's saying they're two different characters, which makes sense because I guess he's saying, like, she's not Mary Jane Watson, but he never says that they'll be bringing her in. So maybe this is the stand in for Mary Jane as a different character and will have her own sort of arc and actualities and, and personality right. is completely different from Mary Jane, but she will be that sort of surrogate character of Mary Jane. That That's kind of what I'm curious. Right, as but that's yeah, so confusing to other people who like that's that's conf- Yeah, for sure. But super confusing. I'm curious as that, if that's what they're sort of because that's the I mean, I'll, that's the impression I have is right. that we won't see Mary no. and Jay in yeah. these movies. I agree. Like I would. If I had to put my money on it, I bet we do not. And yeah, and that's their I, way I of too. throwing it in there. Like, you're never going to see MJ in this universe, but we're going to throw it in just like you never saw Robin. But we're going to throw Christopher Nolan's like, I'm going to give a little nod to Robin. And, and it was cool. But it, it's to some people are like, oh, oh, OK, cool. He's Robin. No, no. <laughs> anyway, well, before we wrap it up, I wanted to. Throw in one more uh, Easter egg that I'm sure a lot of people did not recognize. And so just to sort of let them clue them in on it. Um, there was a point in time and when you see Donald Glover appear in the movie. And people probably know, or maybe a decent amount of people know who Donald Glover is at this point. And they're probably like, oh, he just has such a small role. Well, actually, right. that character that he's playing, Aaron Davis is the ultimate version of a character called the Prowler. And for that, it's like, okay, in one sense, they could have that character actually become the Prowler because one of his things is he's kind of like a cat burglar. And so that's why he kind of perks up when he was talking about something that can stick to walls. And so he was kind of like, oh, well, let me see, you know, that kind of thing. And then 
the other aspect that's big about that is the part when he says, you know, he don't want, he doesn't want these weapons on the streets because he has a, a nephew that lives around here. Well, in the comics, the Prowler, aka Aaron Davis, is the uncle to one Miles Morales, who is the Spider Man that is the current sort of version of Spider Man, who's half black, half Puerto Rican uh, kid. And he wears like a black and red sort of costume, which um, they're sort of laying that Easter egg out there that he is part of this universe. And perhaps we'll see him sometime later on down the line, okay. which I thought was cool. Very and, cool. Uh, I that too. I remember hearing about that as well. Sorry. No, no, no worries. And the last thing I had wanted to mention was that this thing that Sony and Marvel did was so unprecedented. And I am so happy that they were able to come to the table and figure this out. And from everything I read, their whole deal was that basically Sony keeps all the profits from the movie and uh, Marvel will get all the profits from merchandising and toys. So that was how they were able to work this whole thing out. And from, cool. Yeah. And from all intents and purposes, it looks like it's going to work out very well for both parties. And so... After all this, my, my hope, and I have my hands together as I'm seeing this, is that there's a whole bunch of executives at Fox right now sitting around the table on Monday morning and will be like, you know, we've got this Fantastic Four thing that doesn't seem to be working with us. So maybe and that they will finally see the light and say, Marvel, could you, could you help us out? Could you make this work for us? And uh, that's what I'm, I'm really, really hoping for that comes from out of this whole union between Sony and Marvel with Spider-Man. Yeah, I hope so, too. That would be pretty awesome. Well, with that, uh, let's see. Anybody's got one last thing to wrap up with? I know we didn't get to talk about in credit scenes, but not a lot to really talk about there. But I'll, I'll say the. The very very end one was was great was, was quite cu- good. It was it was cute. Um, <laughs> that was a fun one. That was a good one. Funsies, fun time. Bravo, bravo to get Chris Evans to do that because he yeah. showed up there all over the place and it was just great. <laughs> yeah, like he just so you got detention. I was just <laughs> dying. Was... <laughs> Anyways, go ahead, David. No, no, I'm just gonna just wrap things up. Uh, yeah, thanks for uh, listening to the episode. Uh, like I talked about at the end of our, our last regular episode, we'll be uh, probably talking a lot about uh, War for the Planet of the Apes uh, on our next episode next weekend, and then we uh, move right into Comic Con. So uh, we'll be uh, we'll be out there talking about that, and we'll talk more about that uh, probably next weekend before the con gets here. Um, with that, I'm David Lott. I'm Bobby Jackson. I'm Yasha Wilson. And I'm Michelle Curry. Thanks for listening. 